of Oslo International Acting Festival. I hope you survived yesterday, right? And also welcome to Ensepa, which is here now with us, right? And they're going to be today and tomorrow. Um, today we're going to talk about. Uh, today uh, we're going to talk about uh, Michael Checo method. Yes. And this is uh, Lenard Petit. And Lenard is an uh, artistic director of Michael Chekhov Institute in uh, New York, and also um, vice president of the International um, Chekhov Association. Yes, and it's also I just want to mention uh, he is also a writer of the Michael Chekhov Handbook for the Actor, which is an introduction for uh, the method and consists also of a lot of exercises in a pedagogical structure. I would say yes. Some exercises, yes. So, um, first of all, I think uh, the Michael Chekhov uh, bi biography is not that known as Stanislavski's. So I think I just, I just want to mention a couple of small things before we uh, start the interview. Leonard, um, as you probably, you probably know, Michael Chekhov was Anton's, Anton Chekhov's nephew. Uh, he was born in 1882 and he died in 1955. He uh, started up, uh, he, he was born in the pre-communistic Russia. He lived several places in Europe before he ended up his life in the States, where he formulated most of his um, method, I think. Um, and he um, went to several crises in his life. He, for a period, he was an alcoholic. He also had huge variety of impulses, I would say. Um, oh, he was close to Rudolf Steiner for a while, um, and he also worked with yoga. So it's also a big spiritual journey in Chekhov's life, I would say. So this is a complex character, and <clears throat> uh, Chekhov auditioned for Stanislavski as early in, as in 1898. Then Chekhov was 17 years old. So very early, uh, Chekhov became Stanislavski's fa one of his favorite actors, and his first major breakdown, as far as I know, was after working with Stanislavski's affective memory. This was a method to which Stanislavski used at the time to bring the personal experiences into the work, and <clears throat> Chekhov from then on objected against the idea of using your own personal experiences and emotions in the creation of the character or in the work. Because he somehow said that this would limit the actor to the everyday self instead of expanding your, uh, um, your, your creativity to something more than just yourself. Um, from then on, I would say that Chekhov's, some key words in Chekhov's uh, thinking is um, creativity, imagination, um, playfulness, and spirituality. So I think I want to start to ask you um, about this with spirituality, because I've also been to a workshop once, and uh, from my experience, one of the first exercises was about moving your energy body which is not your body, but the energy of your body, somewhere else in the room, and then go there when it's there. And uh, I think some of the um, uh, participants, which was, I would say, more, uh, let's say, materialistic or, or rational or, or atheistic oriented, would maybe have a little bigger challenge of some of these exercises than others. So I, I want to just start to ask you, is this somehow a method for people that are spiritual and religious? <laughs> uh, yes, but it's also a method for um, artistic creation. I mean, the, the whole point of the method is to put the actor into a creative state um, so that they can um, compose the performance, uh, create the role, uh, in a creative way and not in a, a personal way. So this business that you speak about, the energy body, is something that has to, uh, in the first place, be uh, accepted. And uh, it's not a difficult thing to accept, actually it's quite an objective thing. It's um, simply, if you were to look at um, a dead person, 
uh, you would see that something is not with that body. As opposed to looking at a live person, uh, if you compare them, a dead body and a live body, you see that there's something that is different about them. And what's different is this thing that could be called uh, the life spirit or the animating force, soul or whatever you want to call it. Um, it's nothing to be thought of in a mystical or religious sense. Uh, it's an actual objective thing. There's a difference between something that's living and something that's dead. And so in the first order of business in, in my teaching is to uh, awaken the um, student or the actor's sense that this is something that is quite real and quite objective and actually can be uh, worked with. Uh, you know, in the East, people have been working with this for thousands of years with um, Qigong, Tai Chi, uh, yoga, all of these kinds of things. It's, whatever the, the, there's a force, they, in yoga it's called prana, in, um, in, in China it's called qi. We've all heard these words, we, we, we know what they mean, uh, more or less, and it's just uh, an energetic living something that's in us that uh, we actually can use our will and our imagination to move. So, so, so there is an energetic starting point for this way of thinking, and uh, but still, uh, energy can be something that is, is quite metaphysical. But uh, you mean this in a very concrete way or, or as well? Could, yes. Could you give us an example, or exercise, or show us an exercise, or make us do an exercise, which make <laughs> us understand the concept of energy in this kind of work? Well, yes. Uh, simply, if, if you uh, were to take your, your hand and point, you can, in your imagination, from where you're sitting, point into that corner. And you can get a, a real sense of doing that. If you want to try that, please try that. That you can reach beyond yourself, right, without, and you can't see it, but it's something that you can feel, that you're doing. It's an activity that you can feel that you're really doing. And it has to start with this idea that I can do it, and that it exists, and then it will happen. Anything happen? <laughs> but uh, but we work with uh, with this uh, being able to move this this energetic body um, uh, in very specific directions, and there are six dynamic directions that we can move in, and um, they're the same six directions that you can move your body in. You can move your body forward, you can move your body backwards, um, you can move it up, you can move it down, you can make it, uh, you can move it. Uh, so that it grows, and you can move it so that it, so so that you experience yourself getting smaller. And these six dynamic directions are very full of information. the The work is um, uh, it's energetic, but it's it's also physical. And um, and so this idea of this energetic body is that if you speak about energy, it's very vague. And um, if you but we give it uh, a picture, you know, an image, that it looks just like, just like the, the, the body. So the very first exercise that I do with people is I ask them to, to lift up their arm and, um, and then to feel what it is to lift up your arm. What actually are you doing with your body when you lift up your arm? And then to give this imagination that inside the arm is another arm that's made of energy. You cannot see it. And so I, I beg them to try not to see it because it's a kind of energy or, or effort that's put, it's misguided. But you can feel that you can feel that it's possible to move. So that if you move uh, this inner energetic arm first and follow it with the physical arm, you can get a, a sense of this. Again, you can get a sense of this energetic body. So I say, oh, I'll show you what it looks like so that you'll see that you can't really see it. But, so here's me just lifting my arm. And here's me lifting my energetic arm first. So you can't see it, but I can feel it. And when you can feel it, then you can start to work with it and form it and move it in any way you like. And um, so you can, you know, reach across the room and um, kiss somebody without ever having to get up or slap somebody. I mean, you can do this on the stage so that. I can experience what it is to slap somebody without actually slapping them, and so it's a very exciting event to um, to slap somebody. You know, this it's very charged kind of thing, and I can have that same experience through uh, the imagination of movement um, that I'm imagining that I'm doing this, but I'm actually feeling myself doing this uh, with my uh, energetic arm and hand. So this is how Lena Petty and his wife fights. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, yes, we fight across the sea. <laughs> Um, I think this is also very connected to the concept of imagination somehow, and uh, Chekhov seemed to promote imagination as the biggest resource in our life. Uh, uh, somehow he talks about, and uh, talk, talks about it in a way that makes me at least understand that we have an unlimited intuitively potential with our imagination, and um, that this imagination goes beyond everything, even true life. Because uh, I, I know that confronted to the demand of being truthful to life, he says, what if the character's psychology and the inner life is not true to life? Was Don Quixote true to life? So it's, it, this, this is something, this is, uh, this is very interesting when it comes to character, for instance. This is, uh, I mean, what, what does this mean? What is this, prom what is this kind of ima imagination? It sounds like a promotion for our LSD trip, or...? <laughs> well, it could be. I mean, there are, <laughs> there are some techniques that we can use to, uh, using images and energy, when the students or the actors feel quite like they've taken drugs, and they don't have to. So, I mean, we can, um, we work with, with images. Imagination is, is the key uh, to, to making any of this work. It's the key to making the energetic body work, in fact. You have to imagine in the first place that you have it. And uh, w when I was reading Michael Chekhov's book to the actor, he spoke all the time and wrote all the time about uh, imagination and images and Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo, and <laughs> the kind of images that these artists must have had. And I felt quite uh, inadequate that I was completely incapable of meeting Leonardo da Vinci or, or Michelangelo. Um, in my imagination, or in the kind of images that, that I that I could have, but he also said that this uh, there's an independent world of images that exists out there, and uh, it's, it, it is a world into itself, and just with the simple um, simple efforts and concentration, we can access this independent world of images and and use it uh, for our for our work. He really felt that that uh, to work in the personal way was really an enslavement for, for the artist. That, uh, for the, because he thought that, you know, we're actors, but in the first place we're creative artists and we have to work as artists and we have to be in a creative state in order to make what he and Vaktangov referred to as uh, the theatrical lie. The theater is a lie and uh, the job of the actor, or the work of the actor, is to make it into an artistic truth, and the only path to that is by being in a creative state. It sounds also like Carl Gustav Jung uh, came up with this idea about collective unconsciousness, like in a certain layer in us, when we come deep enough in ourself, we, have, we are made of the same material somehow. We have the same basic image and archetypes. Yes. When you talk about that, uh, this, this, that we share images, is this, can this, is this something similar in a way? I don't know if that, if that exactly is similar because he said, you know, you go to this, this uh, uh, independent world of, of images and you pull the images that belong to you from that world. Um, I think what Jung is talking about is uh, this, this archetypal thing which is also uh, some of the source material that, that we use in the Chekhov technique, uh, this idea of archetype for character. Uh, again, um, Stanislavski asked uh, his, his students or his actors to create these very lengthy and in-depth biographies of characters. And um, in, in, I think uh, in some, some book that I read, <coughs> there was, uh, he was talking about Othello. And, um, and it did all this work on Othello and, and you know, what Othello was like when he was 10 years old and all of this sort of thing. And uh, Chekhov felt that this is completely unnecessary, that it was just a kind of uh, stuff that was just stuck in your head that you didn't do anything with anyway. And there was no real point in it. So he moved in this direction of um, finding um, archetypes for characters, and this is a great source because these things are, uh, in is Jung's uh, uh, concept of it, I mean, I can't really speak uh, very eloquently about Jung and what he thought about archetypes, but I, I do know that he said that they were part of the collective unconscious, that the archetypes exist throughout all cultures, uh, and um, we have some 
deep and unconscious connection to these things. And through <coughs> practices that we do here uh, in this technique, like the psychological gesture, we come back to that. We'll come back to the psychological gesture. We can access these uh, these archetypes, and they are a kind of um, force that they have a vibratory quality to them, and uh, we all understand them. We all understand what uh, the hero means, for example, and we can have you know images of Luke Skywalker or whatever uh, about a, a hero. That's not so interesting, and nor is nor is the the hero itself that interesting uh, in terms of, of developing character, but the movement of the hero is really what is interesting uh, and effective for the actor. Because if you, uh, if I were to ask you all just to make a move, to stand up and make a movement in some direction for the hero, and, and you all had your eyes closed, because I do do this in my classes, you would all move in the same direction, and you would not be influenced by anybody else because your eyes were closed. Uh, you would all move in this forward and upward direction. And this is what is interesting uh, about these, uh, these archetypes because they, they, they create impulses for, for movement. The hero's job in, is to take up the quest. That's, a, that's a, really one simple way to define what the hero is, but in taking up the quest, this uh, impulse is forward. Just before we introduce the psychological gesture, I just want to, uh, to introduce a couple of other concepts with uh, a checker. Um, uh, but I also want to mention, when you talk about this uh, imagination and where we create from and so on, and, and where, where does images arise from, um, checker also talks about creating from a higher ego. Yes. What, what does that mean? This is also a difficult, uh, a difficult concept. I mean, one interesting thing that he said was that when an actor walks onto the stage, uh, that there are three entities that enter into that space with, with him. There is the character that he has created, which is a mask. And then there is the actor who's wearing the mask. And then there is this other entity called the higher I, which is controlling the creative elements uh, that he has put into place uh, through rehearsals. Are all these three visible for the audience? Or no. What the audience sees is character. They see the mask. And, um, and the actor is wearing the mask. And I mean, you, we all know that you know, if you really become the character and completely get subsumed into the character, that you would not be able to fulfill the necessary technical business of being on the stage. Like, there's a special down here, uh, down right, that I have to go in to do this monologue. And if I were just completely subsumed as character, I would not be able to do that. I would be wherever I am and do the monologue. It's, uh, there are certain technical things that the actor is, is, is guiding the, the, uh, the, the character through, but the higher eye is, the, is the, um, the creative force that is controlling it, uh, that, is, that, that is controlling the whole situation. Okay. So let's introduce a couple of, or clarify some keywords which is used in, in, in exercises um, of the Chekhov method. Um, first, um, uh, Chekhov separate uh, human, uh, humans in three different, I don't know what you want to call it, but three different uh, forms of uh, thinking, feeling, and willing. This is, this is placed in three different, different seated, three different places in the human body. Right. Could you explain how? Well, what uh, this is this is not uh, uh, an idea that Chekhov invented. This is a very old idea that's actually uh, quite present in uh, Buddhism and um, in Christianity. The whole sort of sense of the the, the Trinity. This is all uh, uh, not nothing new. But Chekhov. Uh, said that this was something that we needed to work with. I think Stanislavski was also working with these things, of uh, these three functions that belong to the human beings, uh, thinking, uh, feeling, and willing. And so uh, a life, uh, a normal human life, is made up of the interplay of these three functions. So you know, I, I think about something, and then I do something about that, and uh, then I have a feeling about what I did. Or I f have a feeling, and it causes me to think about something, and then I do something about that. Or I do something, and I think about it, and then I have a feeling about it. So this interplay is really what makes up a, a human life. And so these things became very important for, for Michael Chekhov. Uh, also, his connection with uh, anthroposophy and Rudolf Steiner 
was uh, is a big influence here as well because this, uh, they have this idea of the threefold human being. These three functions uh, play a very big part in um, their concept of the human. And even uh, Michael Chekhov in, in one of his, uh, it's not, he didn't really write the book, but it's a marvelous book called Lessons for the Professional Actor where he was in New York City teaching um, actors, New York actors. And uh, there were a lot of people from um, uh, the actor studio. Or I don't even, maybe I don't even know if the actor studio was alive then or, or was there then. But people like Morris Karnowski from that generation, they were, he was in the class. Morris Karnowski, and he said in this in this book that um, a play, the play itself, should be looked at as a human being. That it has its thoughts, its feelings, uh, and its and its will impulses. And um, and anyway, these three things clearly. Uh, are connected in the body somewhere, and everything, because everything comes back to the body, the the, uh, the physical body, and um, clearly we think in our heads, and that's the seat of, of thinking, and uh, the seat of feelings is in the chest where the heart lives, and the seat of the will is in the pelvis and lower uh, extremities. So the order we do this, thinking, feeling, and willing, and the form we do it in is uh, telling us who we are. Yes. Yes, uh, so, so, uh, so we can, in terms of looking at character, for example, um, make a determination about this character and say, well, this character is a uh, willing, feeling, thinking person, or a thinking, feeling, willing person, or a feeling, thinking, willing person. So we're interested in this particular uh, hierarchy of um, a function. The first function being the, the, the one that we pay attention to the most in terms of the development physically of the character. Which has a concrete um, consequence in the way you physically work with that. Yes, yes. We, he gave three images to, to work with, which uh, seem incredibly limited, uh, but when you start to play around with them, it becomes quite uh, an infinite kind of um, source to, 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 uh, to, to find the, the character with. So that uh, very simply, on a very sim simplistic level, uh, and it may sound way too simplistic for you, but it's very, actually very involved. That the thinking person's body is a stick and moves as a stick. So in my own country, for example, the president, whom everybody knows, President Obama, is a, we could call him a thinking person, and his gesture life is very rigid and stick-like. Um, but he's a, he's a thinking person, whereas uh, George W. Bush was not a thinking person. <laughs> Uh, he was a, a willing person, so he did things before he thought, it seemed, and uh, his characteristic movements, if you watched him walk, were moving somewhat like a ball, and, um, and uh, I don't know about any other president that I could speak of, but the, the other image is, is a veil, uh, which you know is a, just a soft piece of cloth, which is a characteristic movement of a, a feeling person. But like I said, just talking about it like this sounds incredibly simplistic and, and um, uh, not useful, but it's really very, very rich material. Yeah. We can say there's a difference between a basketball and an egg, for instance, and they're both the same shape. So. Exactly, you can say there's a difference between a, a toothpick and a, um, a baseball bat uh, as a stick, for, for example, and that's a huge difference in uh, the way that the person would work. I mean, this, the work requires a particular type of concentration, and when Chekhov talks about concentration, he does not ever mean thinking. He, uh, he, said, that's his, he said, you know, mathematicians don't think when they concentrate on math. They are with it in, in a physical sense, they're with it. So he describes uh, concentration, this is, uh, it is, we talk about this, it's very important. He talks about concentration as um, a movement towards the uh, image or the object being concentrated on. And he describes it this way, he said, if you see uh, a great piece of art and you stand before it, something happens where you feel yourself drawn to it. You feel yourself moving towards this thing. And this is an unwitting kind of concentration because the object itself is so fascinating that it pulls you. And then you go to see a mediocre piece of art and you, you're sort of moving around, trying to get moved by this, by, by this piece. It's, 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 not, it's not moving you. And so, so you try to move to get moved by it. But um, so, so the, his exercises in concentration are to take completely uninteresting objects, intentionally uninteresting objects, like this glass of water, and to 
put yourself maybe, I don't know, a meter or three meters away from it, and to feel yourself moving towards it. And, um, and this is concentration. Concentration is movement, movement towards something and not thinking harder about something. Because when we think hard about something, we just become locked and stiff in the body. And this is a complete um, anathema to a, a creative state. We cannot be in a creative state if we're tense and physical. It just doesn't work. Another concept of this uh, movement and energy is also the four basic moments, which is connected to the four basic elements, earth, fire, uh, water, and... Yeah, thanks. <laughs> um, so what are the, the moments and, and how can they be used? Uh, these are, uh, in, in his book, uh, To the Actor, the first chapter is, is really about the body, which is right. Because everything has to come through the body. And, um, and through the body we find the psychology. So the idea of psychophysical um, really just means that the psychology and the body are one thing. And that you know, a person who has a particular type of body has a particular type of psychology, and that movement itself, because it's working with the body, has a psychology. So there's a lot of movement in uh, the technique. It's uh, we, uh, if you just the people who worked with me yesterday, realized that we we sat in chairs for out of four hours. We sat down for 20 minutes, I think, at the most, and it was only to explain a few things at the end of the class. So we're always moving uh, in this class. And uh, a nice benefit of movement is a fit body, but that's not the aim. The aim is to uh, absorb, be able to absorb psychological quality and value from the movements that we make so that we can work really all the time creatively, um, especially in rehearsals, but even in life, uh, knowing what's happening from the movement. So in his book, he asks, uh, he describes some exercises that you should do, and he asks the people who are reading the book, the actors who are reading the book, to do these exercises, which you know, probably mostly everyone who's read the book doesn't, doesn't do the exercises. Um, but they're to make big movements, and then he describes the way in which we make the movement, and has four different qualities that one is called molding, uh, which is connected to the earth. And the idea of it is to move as if you were moving through the earth, like this is that, that, that your movement is being resisted. And to move like this for a while, uh, in a big way, to use all of your body to make sculptures in the air, imaginary sculptures or, or whatever. And then, after the body understands what this is, we begin to move the energetic body this way, and the physical body loses all of this uh, this, this, this uh, very peculiar way of moving because when you, when, you present this to, to, when you present this to students who want to become actors, they're fine with it. But when you present it to actors who, are, who want to learn something about Chekhov, they say, well, I would never ever do this. Why would I move like this? You know, this <coughs> <laughs> why, why, why would I do this? And it's, of course you're not going to do that because um, no one's going to understand what you're doing, and the director especially will say, please stop doing that, because <laughs> I don't know what that means. So these movements become what we call inner. That is, that the energy body is moving with this quality of, of earth, of resistance, of molding, and um, a particular type of psychology wakes up, because to move that way requires a tremendous amount of will, so the will becomes active, and so the, the, the will force in the, in the character becomes, uh, becomes active in this moment because it's difficult to just, and so just to move inwardly to pick this up, uh, there's a lot of information that comes. We, we work very much in the present. What is happening now, my reaction to what is happening now is the life that I express. Uh, we don't work at all ever from memory. Uh, or from, um, and so a lot of, yeah, I'll, I'll talk about that later. Yeah. So there, there, are, there are four qualities of movement. There's this molding, then there's, which is connected to earth. There's uh, flowing, which is connected to water. And that is as if the, you were in a river and the, and the flow of, of the river is just taking you. So there's absolutely no resistance in the movement. You're being taken. And again, we find this with the body and then we bring it inside. And then there's, um, Flying, which is connected to air, where the movements are just moving away very, very quickly. And uh, again, we take this inside, and there's, a, there's a, um, 
a, a, a psychology that's connected to that. And the last one is called radiating, which is a really important part of the Chekhov technique. One should be radiating all the time, which is just m this emitting. A radiation just means something leaving me, something that, that's leaving me. So he, Stanislavski was also very interested in this. If uh, you read um, Building a Character, he talks about this very thing of radiating. But this one's connected to fire, where the, uh, there's light and heat or warmth coming from, from the body or from the being who's, you know, the actor. It also has the concept of atmosphere. You can just mention it, which also is one of these things that can be used and also yeah. connects us to the breath as well, can do. Uh, well, yeah, because, uh, I mean, the word atmosphere means, means the space that surrounds, and, um, and so the air itself can be filled with whatever you want to fill it with, whatever imagination you want to fill it with. I mean, if I asked you to, right now, um, imagine that you're, wherever you're sitting, um, it just stinks of urine, of human urine. Uh, you would just start to breathe in a, in, a, in a completely different way and start to talk to each other in a completely different way. And say, well, just breathe in this stench of, of urine and it's everywhere here. Everybody's body is gonna start to uh, be affected by this. It's just pure imagination. But the way I would even pick up this, this glass of water would change because of the atmosphere. I mean, this is not a very interesting atmosphere, actually. Uh, but it's just one that I could <laughs> say to you that you can, you can know because you've been, everybody's been to a place with really stunk of piss. So, uh, you know, uh, he's interested in more finer things, more feeling things. Because he said that if, if, the, uh, if the play could be looked at as a human being, that where it, where it has the play has thoughts, has uh, and it has its feelings and it has its its will. That the atmosphere is the feeling life in the play. It's the soul of the play actually, and uh, each scene, um, uh, each yeah, each scene has its own atmosphere, and that we can change those atmospheres um, as we choose, as the you know, as as we agree upon in rehearsal. Thank you. No, I am the smart in my nose. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> Chico is uh, interested in, if you go back to the character, he's interested in how I, as an actor, would behave in, he's not interested, I mean, he's not so interested in how I, as an actor, would behave in the imaginary circumstances as to explore how the character would uh, 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 behave in the imaginary circumstances. Um, I wonder what this means, uh, again, with this, um, he, he also says something where that transformation is what every actor consciously or unconsciously longs for. This is also put on your pages, actually, um, web pages. So th this is another entrance to the idea of transformation, I think, than many others maybe have. Well, there's a, a very famous, uh if you're a Chekhov person, it's famous. <laughs> uh, meeting that uh, Chekhov had with Stanislavski in Berlin uh, after Chekhov had uh, emigrated and Stanislavski uh, was on tour or something and they, they met at a, a cafe in Berlin where Stanislavski was trying to convince him to come back to Russia. And um, he, he said, no, he didn't want to go back, that he was not interested in, um, in art where two plus two equaled four. He was interested in an art where two plus two might equal eight. And two plus two equals four what was, is what was happening in Russia. And then they had, you know, they talked a long, long time about uh, all of these, these things and they started to talk about um, character. And um, the story goes at this, that uh, uh, you know, Stanislavski said, the character is before me. Uh, I can have an imagination of it, I see what it is. And I grab hold of it and I bring it towards me and I transform that character into me so that I, it is me, it is I, in, in the circumstances. And Chekhov said, yes, I, I agree, the character is in front of me, but I move myself towards the character and transform myself into the character. And if I can do that, and do that successfully, then the character is not subjected to my ego. Um, I become subjected to the ego of the character, and therefore transformation is possible, and the ability to play a character like Hitler could uh, actually happen in, in a, real, um, a real way where I don't have to turn Hitler into me, but I turn myself into Hitler. And so transformation is possible. And I don't have to 
do anything to get around the fact that it's me playing Hitler. I, I just can become Hitler. He talks about that in, in that book, Hitler or St. Francis. <laughs> because he has to work with both sides. You know. Before we open up for questions, I want also to go a little bit into the uh, back to the psychological gesture because I think, I mean, I've seen it described as one of the most important uh, original contributions in the, in in the, in twentieth century acting training. Uh, so I think we should clarify it. Uh, and yeah. uh, I also seen. I mean, there's a lot, I, this is a method used by many people that is also not forcingly Chekhov actors. Um, so, so how should we describe this? Uh, for me, it's also um, to find an energetic and archetypical uh, kind of physical language for the character. Well, the psychological gesture is, I guess, yes, it could be called the flower of the technique. And um, its use is not limited to just one one, one piece, it's actually a, a, a multi-functional tool so that the actor can use a psychological gesture for uh, an understanding, uh, a physical, energetic understanding of the whole play. You can have one gesture that, that for, for the actor signifies the entire play. You could have it for one moment, you could have it for the character, you could have it for a monologue, you could have it for a relationship with another character. Um, so it, it can be used again also for um, this idea of, um, of action uh, that was, uh, Hans was speaking of yesterday as events. And so this uh, uh, psychological gesture is never ever seen by the public. Uh, the audience does not see the psychological gesture. It's too big and um, it's a movement that just wouldn't fit into uh, a normal play, unless we decided to make a play stylistically that was full of psychological gestures, uh, that would be a wonderful thing, and then we could do them. But you know, we can use them for, for film, we can use them for, the, for uh, television, and for the stage. So it's a, it's a, a gesture that's made uh, in the rehearsal room, it's made um, backstage, it's made in your apartment, and, um, and it's not remembered, but we, we uh, we work with it in such a way that um, we can, if we need to, make it in the moment without using the physical body, by using the energetic body. I read that Jack Nicholson and Anthony Hopkins actually use uh, psychological gestures to find the characters. But is it, uh, is it possible to uh, show us the basic exercise here now? A basic exercise in, in, the in finding in finding the um, psychological gesture. Yes, uh, actually, if if you could all do it, you could all do it because you're all sitting down. It's a very very simple thing. If you just um, this it would be an application of the gesture for um, for action. So uh, if you just close your eyes for a moment and imagine a child sitting on a table that has no language yet. Right? It just uh, is sitting there on the table. It can hold itself up, and, but it can't speak yet. And it wants its mother. And it makes a gesture towards its mother. Can you see what that gesture is? It really wants the mother badly. Now, can you make that gesture? Good. Turn around and take a look at what's happening, everybody. <laughs> this is... The I mean, we know this gesture is the first gesture that we made, ever. <laughs> we forget that we know this gesture. We forget that it has any meaning for us, but it has a very, very strong meaning for us. And we can use this gesture uh, in, um, on stage by being able to make it what we say is an inner gesture. We turn this very big gesture into an inner gesture. I mean, that's just one. And uh, this is, is a spe specific application for, for action. I mean, uh, it's interesting, uh, Stanislavski said, you know, we talk about the objective, it's like, I want this, I want to kill this person, or I want to make this person love me, or this sort of thing, and um, that's a very fine thing, but that's a very heady thing, in a way. So we have to turn that into something that we can experience uh, with the body, and so we found that this uh, idea, this is work that I, I have developed, actually, uh, off of, um, basic gestures, uh, archetypal gestures that Chekhov gave. So he gave these gestures and said, these are the gestures that we need to develop, which is a gesture to push, to pull, to lift, to throw, and to tear. And in these gestures is all of action. 
And so in my investigating these gestures, uh, I found these uh, statements of action that, um, and one of them was, I want, and this is, uh, and this is it. So uh, instead of wanting to kill somebody, then you just can kill them, or at least try to kill them. And <laughs> you'd be a whole lot more active and not be thinking about it. But this wanting is, uh, is, is a really wonderful gesture. It, it's, it's very full of life. And it, the idea is, in, in working with the psychological gesture here, to especially uh, for action, is to fill the body up with streams of wanting, or streams of taking, or streams of giving, or streams of rejecting. And it's forever living in the body. So we're not like doing this kind of thing over and over again, but we find a way to sustain this so that I'm always wanting, if that's what I need in the scene, or always rejecting, or always taking. Um, I'm always involved with these streams of activity and many impulses and uh, the whole business of being active, um, which is necessary, is living in the body and it's not just, um, am I being active, am I, am, am, am I really wanting here, am I really giving here, I should be, uh, so you often uh, try to convince yourself that you're doing this, this, this action when you don't have to convince yourself it's living, it's a living thing in you because the energetic body is, is completely active with it. So from this way of thinking, you can read the play and then um, interpret all the characters as archetypes and then find physical approaches to their movements, for instance, through or, this way of... Yeah, just looking at the text and understanding it through action. I mean, that's a basic work of the actor anyway, right? It has to come down to action. And so the questions that we, that we work with are who does what, how, um, and uh, Chekhov uh, go, uh, warned us to stay away from the question of why. He said it's a, it's a question, of course, that needs to be answered, and unfortunately it's a question that is often asked very f in the first place. And he said if we ask that question of why in the first place, we'll never get to how. And how is the mystery of art. But if we ask how, the how will lead us to the why. So in, in, in it's, it, it's true. It, I mean, it really, uh, it's really quite, quite effective way to work, and it's also a pleasurable way to work. We work uh, for the pleasure of it, and to express our pleasure as actors on the stage. This is what we give to the audience, and the audience is always a factor in what, uh, in the conception of the work, and giving the audience our pleasure at at, at uh, working is a, a very, a very high thing, and. Um, and Chekhov said, if it doesn't give you pleasure, don't do it. <coughs> Any questions from the audience? Yeah. Or here? Uh, you know? Yes. Could you, uh, someone give her a mic? Just a short question, I can shout it out. Uh, uh, do you uh, work, or how do you work with, uh, with text? I mean, because you work a lot with the, you're talking about the body and How do we meet the words? Well, how, how does anybody meet the words? I mean, you have to, you have to speak the words, right? But they, you, they have to be a living thing within you. And so, you know, we work with the text. We find a way to, uh, I mean, you know, people break down the text in terms of beats, in terms of action, and all this stuff. We do the same thing. We do exactly the same thing. But we, but we, uh, we, we don't, I mean, I remember in, uh, in, uh, in a class I was taking, we were given uh, a scene to break down in beats. And um, all the students came in and said, well, how many beats do you have? And how many beats do you have? So I had six and I had 10, you know, and I had 12. And so I was, whoa. And the teacher came in and said, well, what, what's going on here? And, and they all gave, we all gave our numbers and what they were. And she said, I have three, the beginning, the middle, and the end. So we try, we try to work in, in, in large pieces and, uh, and not so much at the table, we get right to the work. We get right to, to uh, the staging of something and the working of it, and we work on our feet, and we do uh, a lot of what uh, I think Hans was speaking about yesterday, this active analysis. So it's like you, you, you do it, and you say, well, what was good here? What worked here? Okay, well, that was really good, and we'll keep that the next time we do it. This was terrible, and we'll never do that again. We'll just move on, and this is, and this is, uh, and so we, we also work with the how, you know, so, the, uh, the text says that the person comes into the room, pulls out a gun, and shoots him, and says whatever, or says whatever, and shoots him, you know, so, 
we don't really spend our time asking why he comes in the room, why he pulls out the gun, and why he shoots him. You know, we just come in and do it and find how does he come in the room? Does he come bursting in the room? Does he come sneaking in the room? And in doing this, the life comes and the text comes quite, quite easily. I don't know if that answers your question. Any other questions? Yes? Would you have a mic? Yes, under a mic. Uh, would you say that this uh, method is mostly is a pre for the realistic drama? If, if it is a, a pre? Uh, or uh, is it um, mostly affected? Or um, how to say it? Um, is there any aesthetics connected to it? No, no. Oh, okay. I'm no. sorry. Is this method uh, a, um, preparation? A good uh, work for when we're working in the realistic? In a, um, I think that, that, that this, this method uh, serves any style uh, of, of uh, a performance. Any style. Uh, because uh, it's a matter of degree and intensity and discretion, actually. How much are you going to show? How much are you going to hold back? And, and what, what are you, you know? So we're interested in feeling a lot, a huge amount, and showing very little. I mean, it's, it's possible to do that. And so there's always some sort of something mysterious there, you know. So yes, it's, it's useful for, for in any medium. But with the way, I mean, the foundation of it, the paradigm somehow is built on the idea of energy, something energetic, right? Yes, so still, and imaginative. So still, if I, if, I, if I work this way in something very psychological, realistic, it would add something maybe, which is like... I, 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 don't, I don't really understand what you mean. Uh, the aesthetics of it would, I, I mean, if, if we would have a director here and actors which are completely into Chekhov, and they were supposed to do something that was very social, realistic, political, and this, this should be only social, that's what it's all about. It's a, it's a political play, we want it to be completely political. Would it still add, um, add, uh, add something that didn't belong to that form? That's what I'm asking. I don't know, I mean, you know, what, the difficulty of acting, I think, is knowing what to do. And, um, and, but this, this allows us to find what to do, and again, it's all a lie. Whatever we're doing is a lie. It's, it's, it's not really happening. As, uh, it's not until we, until we make it into art. So uh, the technique, again, is uh, a means to put us into a creative state so that we can do anything that we need to do uh, in any style or any form that it needs to take. We still have to be creative artists in doing it. I mean, even if we're you know, on a soap opera or making a very realistic uh, uh, staging of something, it, it, if we're just going to stage it for, if it was just looked so that it was real, that's not interesting at all. It's not art, okay. right? So we have so to... So this have, idea is already in... It's yeah, artistic. That's, that's it's, we're well, artists yeah. making art okay. using artistic means. And these means that he u uses are useful <coughs> for all arts, or for all artists, for painters, for composers, musical composers, for writers, for, um, for sculptors for actors, you know, for musicians. A anybody can use these techniques. This is what he really wanted to do, was to create a, a language and a technique that is, uh, you know, uh, us useful by everyone. I have a very simple question. Do we have a lot of questions here now? Let's take one by one. Keller? I have a very simple question. If a man uh, comes into a room to shoot somebody else, doesn't he have to know why he's doing it? And because um, isn't it a question of first why and then how? Because isn't the how an aesthetic question? Yes, it is an aesthetic question, but if you're, I mean, if a man comes into a room in real life and shoots somebody, certainly he knows why he's doing it. But if a man comes onto the, into a room on the stage to shoot somebody, he's already involved in an aesthetic form. He's already involved in something artistic, and so... Uh, Wait this a second. <laughs> <laughs> Aber 
Entschuldigung, er hat doch aber, er hat ja ein Drama, er hat ja ein Stück. Er hat ein Drama, er hat ein Play. Er hat eine konkrete Situation, he has a concrete situation, in der er handelt und er hat möglicherweise auch davor Situationen. In which he acts and probably even before the, that. Und er hat danach auch wieder Situationen. He had situations like that and after that he has situations like that. Also er ist doch nicht losgelöst äh, von dem konkreten Gegebensein, von, dem, von der konkreten Situation, in der er sich im Stück auf der Bühne verhält bzw. befindet. He's not, um, he's not disconnected from um, what's happening on the stage. No, he's not. He's very connected to what's happening on the stage. He's on the stage. He's performing. Aber dann muss er doch wissen, warum er den Mann tötet. But then he has to know why he's uh, killing the man. Well, uh, usually the, the, uh, the, the playwright would solve that problem for him. I mean, a lot of the, a lot of the whys are, are right, right there on the page. Exactly. And, uh, and they don't need to be considered uh, any, any more than, than what's given. I think the two, the, this discussion will continue later with, um, uh, after the break with uh, Gianluca. So we, go to, we try to make questions and then we can have the arguments in the next section, I think. Uh, we had a question up here as well, right? No? Then it's called, yeah, but. Uh, you talk about the energetic body and the gestures as being invisible to the audience. Uh, but I guess at some level you have to work with the gestures that are actually visible as well? Or do you just trust that they will appear? You mean, you mean, like, you mean like everyday gestures? I mean like whatever, yeah, or just like whether you, know, pull, you pull on your ear or clench your jaw. Yes, of course, or, of course. That's, this is uh, you know, the outer business that's, that, that, that's done. But you know, while I'm doing this, I could be slapping you. For example, right or whatever, right? Uh, or I mean, so yesterday, yesterday in class we did this simple exercise of um, the gesture that they were making was to grow and grow and grow and grow. And while they were doing that, they were shaking somebody's hand. So there was, you know, there was this outer thing that the uh, that seen the business we could call it. And then there's the inner life. And my reaction to the inner life uh, created by the gesture is. I'm, without, without question, the truth. It's, the tr it's my truth in this moment. And my reaction to that, I'm really reacting to what's going on within me right now. And this is the truth. And so, this is why I said we don't use memory. We don't work with that. We work with the present time, right now, a real time event that's happening, an inner event, and responding to that. The audience, you know, uh, assumes that it has to do with the play. And of course it does, but it really has something to do with me uh, and my, what I'm doing. Then you can pass over the mic to Katrina. Thank you. Uh, so I'm also interested in the why thing, because uh, here in this school, we're um, like when you know why you're doing an action, you're you'll ask, you'll accept anyhow. So how do you like ground the feeling in your body when you're just working with the how? Because the why uh, is always connected to the feeling in the situation, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, you have to answer that question of why. Absolutely, it must be answered. What he's suggesting is that that is not the first question to answer. That, it, that, it, that it, if you answer that, you, you're in a cold, rational, intellectual place, which is not a place for the actor to be. But if you answer the how you do it, you will find your way to the why, and you're in a warm acting place. Okay. Could you pass over the mic to that part of the audience? Yes, that row. Hi, I'm very concerned about these archetypes, because it reminds me sort of stereotypes and is it possible to uh, do these archetypes without, you know, confirming stereotypes of society? That doesn't it limit me to kind of um, only confirm uh, the stereotypes and not, you know, show people that another world is possible? Well, um, there's a huge difference between stereotype and archetype. Um, so, for example. Um, the chair that you're sitting in, right? The chair itself is an archetype, 
okay? But the chair that you're sitting in and the chair that the person next to you is sitting in and the chair that the next person is sitting in, those are all stereotypes. A stereotype is just a copy of something. This is why uh, actors don't like the idea. This is why races don't like the idea of, of being stereotyped because it makes them all one thing, as you say. But an archetype is an actual powerful force. It's the prototype from which all types derive. So, uh, and as I said, we're not interested in playing um, what is maybe the first image you get of the hero. The, the archetype is really a crystallization of the will force of the character because we find it through the deeds that the character does in the play. It's what it's, it's a, it's a, Aristotle says that a man's character is the sum total of his actions. And so we can add up the actions of the character as given by the author and find uh, the archetype, which is not a stereotype. We, and, and we don't also play, if, if I chose the devil, for example, as um, an archetype, and I came out and played the devil, it would be interesting for about a minute. Right? It's just all this force, and everybody goes, oh my god, that's such a power. And then, you know, it's like, with perfume. It's too much. You know, you don't you stop smelling. So we, we feed off of it. We don't present it. It's, a, it's another thing, and it, and, it, and it directs the will of the character. And, um, and, it, and it's not the thing itself at all. That's not interesting. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. But how about gender? Are there male and female archetypes? Or because my first uh, impression about the hero was that he was a male character moving forward and upward, and you made this gesture, which was kind of male. So, how do I. You know. It's a, it's a hero male. Well, I mean, we have these ideas, perhaps, that they are, you know, gender-oriented, but, but in terms of working with them for the character, not at all. I mean, you know, you can have a, a character who uh, is a man, but whose archetype is um, uh, a mother. Okay. You know, uh, it, it, it all depends on, on, on what they do, you know. I mean, I have this idea about Hamlet, for example. He's a prince. A prince is an archetype actually, but that's not his archetype, right? I have this idea that he's a slave, as a, that, that's his archetype, but he really is playing a prince. And I, I don't know if that, that doesn't clarify the gender thing, but, um, you know, a man can be a queen, uh, and, and, and uh, et cetera, et cetera, or it, 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 it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. It's the impulse that matters, the impulse of the hero, the impulse of the devil. Right, the impulse of the witch. I mean, everybody thinks the witch is a, a, is a feminine thing, but it doesn't matter, you know, it depends on, on the impulse, and that's, that's what's interesting. Okay. Uh, just a second, we have a question down there. Could we pass, yeah, you, could we pass the I had a very important question. <laughs> <laughs> she was first. I just want to add that Jung talks about archetypes. He says that this is an energetic, um, Okay, force, which is that like uh, uh, absolutely full and can never be emptied. Yes, and so it's, so it's a great source of, of it, it is a vibration that the energetic body actually starts to vibrate in sympathy with. Yes. Uh, I understand that you have to rely a lot on, on the playwright, of course, on the text. Uh, if you're doing a play, yes. I mean, yeah. you know, the, the Chekhov says that the, the theater, the actor is the theater. We, we can make theater without playwrights. You do uh, that. Uh, and yeah, and, and how do you work then? Could you tell me a little bit about what that work would look like? Well, it's devised theater, you know. It's, it's, it's been around for a while. People, a group of people get together and, and have <laughs> ideas. And they, they work together, you know, and they might work through archetypes. Or in, in our case, in this case, might, you know, just work through, uh, say, well, you know, this character is going to be fire, and this character is going to be air, and this character is going to be water. And then they start to work together and see what even the relationships are between those elements. and. Um, and this sort of thing, and you know, theater is born. It's uh, people make theater all the time out of nothing, right? But it's nice to work with playwrights too. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna have. Uh, is there many I'm questions now? I have one there, one there, and one there. Okay, so we're gonna have uh, first Gianluca. Yeah. Uh. And meantime, uh. can someone uh, send Hans and Mark? Could Could you say in a way that? Um, this psychological gesture is a focus of movement? A focus? Yeah, a focus. Yeah, I mean, everything in the technique, there's lots of tools, 
and the technique, every one of those is a focus. I mean, so I can focus my rehearsal tonight on the psychological gesture, or I can focus my rehearsal tonight on the archetype, or on the, the directions, or on the, the imaginary center, or etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Focus so for the actor. It's a focus for the actor. The audience doesn't know anything about it, and if they do, uh, it's a problem, in in a way, right? It's it's my food, and and I eat it, and and it fills me up. My expression is a consequence of that. So that's for the audience, the consequence of the gesture. But the gesture itself. Is for me, only for me. The yeah. actor. Okay, so uh, I'm sorry, Hans, they sent the mic in the wrong direction. <laughs> oh, you have? Oh, okay, so go on, Hans, then it's you. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> could you, uh, do you know anything about this uh, split <coughs> between Chekhov and Stanislavski? They had a meeting in Berlin and then they went uh, together uh, from each other, not <coughs> agreed. Uh, when you said that we're not working with memories, we're only working with presence, uh, is that part of that split, or is it possible to do both? That was a lot of questions. Um, have you been here the whole time? I did speak about the meeting in Berlin. Okay. No, I I came late. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> it was uh, the what I what I understood from that meeting in Berlin was the, this was the separation between the, the understanding. Uh, of uh, approach to character, of this idea of transformation that you were speaking of yesterday. And this was, this was the split. I mean, Chekhov has a, uh, a tremendous amount of respect for Stanislavski and what Stanislavski, you know, uh, that legacy and what he gave to, to, to the actor and supports that, you know, 100%. But at that point, he splits uh, with it, in this idea of transformation. But then the, the, the myth that this uh, sort of Chekhov, um, uh, uh, technique uh, is a technique for geniuses, as Chekhov was a genius uh, actor, uh, and it's not a technique for uh, normal, talented people. What do you think about that? <laughs> I think that it is a technique for talented actors. Uh, geniuses, I don't know. Um, because all of the material in it is a direct appeal to the talent. It does not appeal to the um, historical elements of the person or anything like that. It, it's, uh, it's, it's there to excite the talent in the actor. And f at any given moment, I mean, he says, I act because I'm an actor. And, I, and, and an actor must be able to become jealous for absolutely no reason other than the fact that they are an actor. And if they cannot do that, they're not actors. And so it's for talented people. And, and he says it is. I mean, he said Stanislavski was kindergarten. Uh, my, my, my technique is the university. That's what he said, you know. I, I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so you have a question. The university is for the more talented, isn't it? <laughs> well, it's for people who uh, you know, have some maturity, I suppose, you know, some skills are already. Okay, we have a question here. Let's not go into debates. Are you, Karen? We do that in the next round. Okay. I wonder if you could say something about the relationship towards the audience, because you started, or you mentioned that yesterday, that that was very important in your technique. And what you explain now, I uh, feel is quite uh, introvert techniques for an actor to use. Well, the, the consequence of most of this work is a radiant being, okay, who is on stage giving, and um, all the time aware that there is an audience there to be given to. And, uh, and so it is, it, we, we never forget that. We absolutely never forget that, that even when we start on the first rehearsal that there's an audience going to be present. And, um, and as a director, uh, I, I do the same thing, you know. Um, I, I sit in the theater and imagine there's an audience all around me uh, watching my rehearsals. And I ask them, how am I doing? You know, is this, is this working for you? And, and, uh, and, and I'm always, it's always, it's always there. It's, it's, always, it's, a, it's a kind of communion that's necessary. And, and it's, it's present all the time. I mean, I see lots of young actors who work and they <laughs> space like this and they have no sense that, that, that ultimately it's, it, it's got to be, you know, transmitted out past uh, them, their, their, them and their faces. Or they very easily turn their back on the audience without significance. You know, I mean, it's fine to turn your back on the audience <coughs> if you do it with significance. Uh, but they, you know, their back is to me. So I'm getting a lot from you, and I'm really acting with you, and that's really strong. It's really great, but it didn't leave uh, a 
us. It didn't go out there. So it's an it's a, it's a important thing for us all the time to consider this. You have a question there? Yeah. Um, um, it's a question of the body. And I'm a choreographer and also working in physical theater. And sometimes I meet people from the theater background. And uh, they talk about the body, ah, but the body has its own intention, it's kind of mysterious. And for me, they're all one. And from what I understand of the Cheko, it's also seen as the person is one, including all elements. But I'm, one, I'm curious, how do you meet if you get that kind of approach for someone? Ah, but the body is so mysterious, it's something else. And then the person or the I well, is a separate, or the intellectual or the mind bit. From the very beginning, we understand that the body is the instrument. And what we have to do is guide this instrument to play this instrument. So we have to we have to understand that it's one. Yeah, that it moves as a unity. I mean, we separate it, you know, into the thinking part, the feeling part, the willing part, the energetic part, the physical part. But in the end, we have to put it all back together again, so that it is one thing, and it is the instrument that's finely tuned and is listening to the instructions that from the higher eye, if you will, right, and 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 can do with excellence every night things we wanted to. Could you pass the mic if to your left? Yes. <clears throat> I wonder a little bit about uh, how the actor influence each other because they have not talked so much about relationship. And I wonder if, if it's a strong meeting that you can change your, uh, if I'm a thinking person, I can become a feel more feeling. As of how can I change during the meetings on the stage? Uh, that they're not static. I mean, how the cooperation. I, I, don't, I don't really understand how, what, what you mean. No. I, uh, instead of being static to be Obama or <coughs> no play, what would happen to Obama if he came in a crisis where his thinking is? crashing, he, it doesn't help him. Or he meet the person that makes such big influence in him. That's something else in, in other energy in him to be start a, to, to yeah, work for him. To be a human being, we have to be involved in all three functions. Yes. And so, you know, to say that Obama was a thinking person is just to say that that's, that's the first function. Mm. So, you know, there's a... Uh, there's uh, some little test that I have invented for a character, which I call the slap test. So, you know, if you were to slap President Obama in the face, he'd probably say, well, what did you do that for? Mm. Right? Well, <laughs> but, but if, if you were... touched him a little more deeper then... Pardon me? If I touched him a little more deeper... <laughs> <laughs> but if I slapped George like Bush in the Clinton. face, he'd what probably slap me back. <laughs> You know, so I mean, you have to be involved in, in all three functions, and, mm -hmm. and to, to deny any of them is to, is to deny your humanity. So we have to deal with them all, and um, it's just this business about. Uh, that's why I said it sounds very limited, but you have to investigate. It's just the way that Obama moves; is, mm -hmm. it informs his psychology mm -hmm. as, as a thinking person, and that's all. That's all that is. It doesn't mean that he has no feelings. Mm. And that he can't, he can't be uh, affected uh, in, in, in that particular realm of his being. He certainly can, and I'm sure he is. But how, how do you work with the relationship? Well, the relationship is, 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 uh, is only interesting when it's, when, it, when it's changed up. I mean, you know, Romeo and Juliet are not two feeling people. That's not so interesting, you know. Romeo is a willing person, and Juliet is a feeling person. So already that, in, that, that relationship in that play becomes much more interesting than to say that they're both feeling people. That's so really terribly boring, which is what most people do with that play. Mm -hmm. I mean, if they do it in, in a regular sort of way, they make both of these uh, characters feeling people, both of them lovers as archetypes. And that's a recipe for disaster. There's no, there's no uh, contrast. There's no. no real meeting point that, we, that, that has any, any um, struggle in it. Mm. So, uh, you know, we're conscious of these things. We're conscious of polarities. It's a huge part of the, of the technique. And these things, there's a lot of vibration between polarities. Mm. So uh, exactly. relationships are only good when, there are, when they are polar like that. Mm. I'm, I'm sorry, we have to interrupt this. Uh, uh, you, you're going to have the very last question, if you have a short one, uh, Jan. Okay. Uh, 
it should be answered with yes or no. <laughs> <laughs> She's a very good actress, so she, she has a good imagination. So she can if you it. have three actors in front of you, one is from Stanislavski, one is from Lee Strasberg, and one is from the uh, Chekhov. Um, it will be, you have to say, uh, you have to say something more than yes or no, actually. But it's short. How can you see the difference? Will you see your Chekhov actor? And what is better with this actor compared to the two others? <laughs> well, um, in, in terms of, of what they can do uh, as actors, I mean, this, this, it's not a question that, that the Chekhov technique is a better technique than the Strasberg technique or the Meisner technique or what Stanislavski or anything like that. It's not a, a question of that. It's a question of, of, of how they're going to work. Now, the, the Chekhov actor will do things, right? If, if I'm directing, the Chekhov actor will do the thing and try to find out why he's doing it. The Strasberg actor will ask me why I asked him to do that thing and the Stanislavski actor would probably ask the same question or, or I, I wouldn't do that thing. <laughs> right. But the Chekhov actor would do it and then find a way to justify it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leonard. Uh, we're going to have a very, very short break. So see you back here in five minutes, okay?